Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for Tuesday, February 16, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 meeting, board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entity without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion is applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Jamison, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of the quorum of the committee? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Joes. Present. Ms. Pasture. Present. Ms. Rowe. Present. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jamison, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Ms. Mana. Present. Ms. Crew. Present. Edward. Okay. Our next item is opening remarks. Um, uh, we, we were not finished. I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Saris? Present. Dr. Scriven? Present. Ms. Burnoff? Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Our next item is opening remarks. I'd just like to say how excited I am to be in this leadership role. It's going to present me with the opportunity to develop my leadership skills, and I'm extremely happy to be working with this group of people. Uh, and all of, you know, it's several different conversations I've had with Ms. Barr and, and her staff. I've, I met with them one time. I'm just extremely impressed with their credentials and what they bring to the table. And it's such a well-rounded staff that it certainly appears that they complement each other with their respective backgrounds that they bring. Uh, so I'm extremely happy and I hope that that as we progress, I just continue to develop my skills. Thank you very much. OK, our next item is reports. Our first item is the official is the Office of Internal Audit FY21 mid-year update. And for that, I call on Ms. Barr. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Uh, Mr. Corns, that would be the FY21 mid-year update attachment. Yes, thank you. So thank, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present the summary of the audit activities that our office has completed from July 1, 2020 through December 31, 2020. I plan to present a high level overview of the activities completed because most of this information was already presented in detail at previous audit committee meetings. I know that some committee members are new and may have questions about details related to the information shared today. And if time permits, I would be happy to answer these questions either as I go along or at the end of the presentation. However, if the allotted time for the topic expires, I would be happy to further discuss any other questions that you all may have through whatever process Mr. McMillian desires. So Mr. Corns, if you could please go to page one of the report. 
Um, typically, we, we present the hours used to date to complete all direct and indirect audit activities. However, due to the ransomware attack, November 2020 hours were lost. Also due to the ransomware attack, general office responsibilities and staff development activities are much greater than 50%. You'll see that um, professional development is at 78.3% and general office responsibilities is at 68.7%. And this is due primarily to resources that were directed to recovery activities that included researching new cloud-based software opportunities, improved report templates for investigations and audits, improved internal audit website. Uh, we had to review recovered files and emails to attempt to recover information such as already published reports. We also had to train for new software used and implemented by BCPS had to have our uh, computers re-imaged, and we had to have some additional assistance received to address some te technical difficulties. And we had to attend some focused training related to cybersecurity and ransomware attacks. So I just wanted to point out that, yes, it is above the 50% mark, but those are some of the reasons, some of the primary reasons as to why that occurred. Mr. Corns, if you could go to page two, please. So on this page, <clears throat> this um, indicates the number of cases that we've closed as of December 31st. It is, it is 37 during the first six months of the fiscal year. Approximately 32% of these cases were referred to management for their review and disposition. Um, and there were a variety of categories that, to classify the allegations that we received in the office. And during the first six months, you can see that 24% of our cases were related to conflicts of interest and approximately 14% were related to misuse of company property. Uh, page three, Mr. Corns. So we classify on um, the allegations that come into our office as either fraud, waste or abuse, and the definitions are provided on page three of, of this report. Approximately 40% of our cases received did not fit into the category of fraud, waste, or abuse. However, 30% received were identified as potential fraud and approximately 27% were identified as abuse cases. Page four, Mr. Corns. So we have um, various substantiation levels and primary case outcomes that are defined on page four of this report. And as you can see, an allegation can be substantiated, partially substantiated, unsubstantiated, inconclusive, referred to management, or not investigated. So for the first half of, of the fiscal year, approximately 62% of these allegations received were either referred to management or simply did not include enough information to be investigated. However, approximately 19% of the allegations were substantiated and 16% were unsubstantiated. Page five, Mr. Corns. So the audit services unit <clears throat> completed 95 risk-based audits, reviews, and follow-ups during the first half of the year. These activities occurred at 72 schools and 23 offices, including the Board of Education and the superintendent. And the types of audits were school activity fund, procurement card audits, and reviews and, and follow-ups. <clears throat> we also continue to conduct continuous monitoring related to management's corrective action plans included in external audit reports, specifically completed by UHY and the Office of Legislative Auditors. We did complete the review of UHY objectives 8 through 12, noted in their report related specifically to procurement card transactions. We previously communicated these results at our October 6, 2020 meeting. And as already mentioned, the ransomware attack caused some unplanned recovery activities that significantly, significantly impacted this area. However, we in the office look at this as a positive to continue to improve our operations and efficiencies in the office and the system. Even with the pandemic and the ransomware attack, we were still able to complete and issue 132 reports related to audits, reviews, follow-ups, and closed investigations 
as of December 31, 2020. Um, if we could go to page six, Mr. Corns. So here you'll see the summary of the audit committee activity and, and we did have three meetings during the first half of the year. And even though we only met three times, we really accomplished a lot um, throughout the first half of the year. And one of the primary accomplishments of the committee um, was the revision of the Office of Internal Audit Charter and the actual development of an audit committee charter. We've never had one before. And the committee unanimously passed a motion to have the charters move forward to the full board for discussion and approval. And the same motion also included language to have the Office of Internal Audit make a presentation to the entire board about what the office uh, operations are at the same time that the charters are presented. Additionally, another accomplishment that we made was that we began to publish our audit reports on the BCPS website um, prior to the ransomware attack. And we also developed a process for communicating sensitive and confidential information to the board members. So again, that's at a very high level, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but because we have presented in detail to um, and at previous audit committee meetings. So I thank you for your attention and welcome you, welcome any questions that you may have. Okay. Board members, any questions for Ms. Barr? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, Ms. Barr, we've been hearing a lot of um, things about payroll, is the Office of Internal Audit doing any um, work in regard to um, payroll situation since the ransomware attack? And has your office been receiving complaints in that regard? We have been um, contacted to do some work in the payroll area. So the answer to your first question is yes. And um, we have received a, a, a few complaints through the hotline related to that particular issue. So the answer to both questions is yes, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? May I have a motion to accept the FY21 mid-year update? So moved, Rowe. May I have a second? Second, Pasture. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jones? Ms. Jones? Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes? Three in favor. Our second item is investigative unit statistics. And for that, I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, Mr. Corns, that is the document that should be, uh, I believe it says January graphical analysis. Okay. One, one second, I'm, I'm grabbing it now. No, you're fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we'd like to present the information related to um, the investigations uh, conducted by our office uh, during the month of January. Um, so in January, as you can see, we did receive eight cases um, 
that came in through our hotline. Uh, this top chart will show the breakdown um, of, of each of those cases, how, how they're categorized. Uh, and for the year, uh, for the fiscal year, uh, so seven months through, uh, that puts us at 53 cases total. And then again, for those 53 cases, you can see here in the second chart, the, the breakdown of each. Uh, again, large um, portion going to misuse of resources uh, and then management issues uh, are, the, are the two categories that, that truly stick out above the rest. Uh, the third chart on the bottom of this page allows us to uh, take a year over a year um, over year look at the number of cases that come in through our hotline. Uh, and for the first time in several months, you can see that uh, the number of cases that we received uh, for the month of January uh, were kind of in line with what we've seen historically. Um, truly, since October, everything has been um, much less um, than what we've historically seen for each of the months. Uh, but January is, is the month where we have, have finally caught back up. Um, and again, that is for the 53 cases so far this year. Um, I can tell you that so far this this month of February, we are well below um, the, the number of what we would historically see. Uh, going into our second page, uh, we're going to talk about the same um, eight cases that, uh, that have come in for the month of January and the same 53 cases that have come in um, for the fiscal year. This time we want to take a look at how they're categorized in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, so that top chart, that shows us the eight cases for January. Uh, you can see one's considered fraud, one's waste, and then three are abuse. And then three fall outside of that, that categorization. So they're not really fraud, waste, or abuse, uh, but it's still information that came in through our hotline, so we do categorize them. Um, for the fiscal year, for the 53 cases that have come in thus far, you can see the breakdown uh, of those cases in this second chart. And then our third chart, uh, again, a year-over-year -year, uh, look at how all of the cases are categorized uh, that have come in uh, in terms of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, and you can see relative consistency throughout the three years. Uh, the current fiscal year, FY21, is purple. And so you can see there is a little bit of a spike um, in the fraud category uh, as well as waste um, and, and just a little bit of dip in the other two. Uh, I can tell you in terms of the waste, typically we only see one, between one and three allegations each fiscal year. Um, I think this fiscal year we're, we're already um, maybe at, at two or three, which is why uh, it's such a, a larger percentage. Um, but typically what we have seen in the past is this all tends to trend out um, by the time we get to the, the end of the fiscal year. Okay, and as we slide to our third page, uh, now we're going to talk about cases that we have closed uh, during the month and during the fiscal year. So during the month of January, we closed two cases. Um, one of those was unsubstantiated and the other was a, a management issue uh, that was not investigated. And then for the fiscal year, you can see that we've closed 39 cases. Um, and this, this actually um, ties back a little bit to what Ms. Barr presented previously, uh, but now we have an additional month uh, to add on to that. But uh, seven cases were substantiated, seven were unsubstantiated, uh, one was inconclusive, and then we have uh, uh, the 24 that were management issues uh, or not investigated. And as we scroll down to our year over year, uh, analysis, you can see uh, the breakdown um, between each of the categories for each of the fiscal years. And that, Mr. McMillian, is our uh, presentation for our internal, our investigative unit update. Thank you. Board members, any questions for Mr. Fletcher? Yes, uh, Mr. McMillian, this is Ms. Pastua. I just need some more clarification on that. Um, non-fraud, waste, and abuse category, please. Certainly. So, it, Mr. Corns, if you scroll back up to, I believe it's page two. Is this where you mean, Ms. Pasture? 
Yes. Okay. So we have uh, definitions that are um, developed in accordance with ACFE, the, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and the um, Institute of Internal Auditors to define what is fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, and so as each case or as each allegation comes in through our hotline, uh, we run it through a triage process and see where that case lies in terms of is it an allegation of fraud or is it an allegation of, of waste or abuse? And sometimes it's none of the three. Um, sometimes it's something as simple as, um, uh, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm not a parent of a BCPS child, yet I receive telephone calls from, uh, I receive robocalls from BCPS. That'll come in through our hotline. That's not necessarily an allegation of fraud, waste, or abuse, uh, but it's still something that comes in through our hotline. So we'll handle it. You know, we'll send it to the appropriate level of management uh, to make sure that it's addressed. Uh, but it, it falls into that non-fraud, waste, or abuse category. Okay, it seems like we get um, by year certainly a good number of those. Can you give me some other examples? I got the, the robo calls, but Certainly. Um, we often see um, uh, cases that will come in through our hotline that are simply a regurgitation of something that may be in the press. Um, and, and also we'll receive questions um, uh, that will come in that really just need to be rerouted uh, to the appropriate, uh, appropriate level of management. Uh, to be honest, we received everything for requests for transcripts to uh, requests for letters of recommendations. Um, so sometimes it's 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 a catch-all. People will see the link and and get that information to us. Uh, but again, we we still categorize it um, in terms of fraud, waste, or abuse, and then obviously the the non-fraud, waste, or abuse, and then get it to the appropriate level of of management that that truly needs to see that information to to do something with it. Gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. Board members, any other questions? Mr. McAllen. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I would like to know of those non waste, fraud or abuse complaints. How many of those are things that fall into the category of our employees um, attempting to report what they consider to be mismanagement of HR personnel or they're complaining about their managers, et cetera. So how many of those are employees complaining about unfair treatment? So I, I would not have an exact number for you at the moment. Um, uh, I believe that's something we could probably look into um to to go back through some of our cases uh depending on on how it's worded and, and what specific information is provided uh some of that may fall into um a, a fraud waste or abuse situation depending depending on what they're truly alleging in that um so it, if that makes sense so there are some things that even though it might be an HR issue, wouldn't necessarily be forwarded to HR if it's something that is illegal waste, fraud, or abuse? No, well, so if something is truly an HR issue, we're, we're certainly gonna get that to HR. Um, mm -hmm. and, and depending on what it is, we may ask for them to provide us a response back so that we can include that in our uh, information in, in our records so that we can close that that case. Um, or it may be something where we give them a portion uh, of the information that came in through the hotline and we may investigate the other part of it. OK, so when you do that, can you um, give us a list and a title for each? When you when, that report. I'm sorry, when we when we do what I'm I'm sorry. Well, so when you give us the data for um, employee complaints um, that fall into the category of HR issues, can you give us um, an aggregate list and a title for the type of complaint? 
the reason I'm asking for this is because it strikes me as odd that for an organization our size, we have so few complaints coming in and such a large proportion of those are being forwarded to staff. And one of the things I hear in the community is that people are concerned to call the Office of Internal Audit with complaints because they're concerned that those complaints will be forwarded to their superiors and they fear retribution or retaliation. And so what I'm trying to figure out is exactly which types of complaints get forwarded on to staff and exactly which types of complaints stay truly confidential. Sure. Mr. Corns, did something happen here? No, sir, Mr. McMahon, we're still online on air. Okay. That was the end of my question. Thank you. Any additional questions? Hearing no questions, may I have a motion to accept investigative unit statistics? So moved, Roe. May I have a second? Second past you Ms. Jamison, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Jones? Abstain. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you, three in favor. Our third item is summary of procurement card review results for schools and for that I call on Ms. Manna. Good evening and thank you Mr. McMillian. I see the slide presentation is up. Thank you Mr. Corns. Uh, last summer before I get into the presentation um, I wanted to say that last summer into the fall we started a project to review procurement card transactions at selected offices, and then we moved on to review them for schools. We, re we reported a summary of the offices reviewed at the October um, 6th Audit Committee meeting. Those who were, who were on the committee last year may recall that presentation. Uh, this review is similar and completed with the same methodology, but at the schools. Um, if you can go ahead and move on to slide two, please. We applied our analytics to complete this review with for the period of March 16th when school closures started through the end of the last fiscal year, July 6th of 2020. The criteria we used was whether or not the school and we broke it down for each level because it was a little bit different of a population for these transactions. So any high school that had 35 or more transactions, middle school greater than 30, elementary greater than 25 and special schools greater than 15 or if they also, the average transaction was greater than 500, or if the percentage spent to that compared level was greater than 5%, then they were selected in this review. Next slide, please. So we looked at um, the population was 168 schools that had transactions within that period. We looked at 44 of those schools that met our criteria and there were 71% that we reviewed the total transaction amount. So we did not look at all of the transactions, but there was a majority of the dollar value captured in this review. Next slide, please. We completed this review through inquiry with the selected um, procurement card holders and approving officials, which were typically either the principal and in some cases, if the principal was the cardholder, it was the community superintendent. Our objectives were to determine if the transactions and purchases were approved, if documentation was retained, and if the purchases um, were for the continuity of instruction and operations. We also captured, even though it wasn't necessarily a finding or an issue, we captured any purchases that had a 
uh, greater value than $50 per item that were either at a student's residence or employee's residence for the continuity of instruction. Next slide, please. For the first two objectives, the approval of the purchases and the retention of the documentation, there were no findings identified during those uh, for those selected PCARD transactions. Next slide. For the third objective, when we were looking at the uh, continuity of instruction and operations, we determined that there were three transactions at two different schools that were unallowable. One was for uh, more of a personal purchase of flowers for teachers. Um, and then at another school, there were two purchases of bleach and professional cleaners. And we consulted with the Office of Operations to determine what is allowable and what is not allowable to be purchased in this in this sense, and uh, they had more communication with the school to make sure that they were aware of what the requirements were. But we identified those two purchases totaling $486.60 that were not allowable. And the next slide, please. Our last objective when we were trying to determine the items that may have been at um, employees and student residents um, we identified at 12 schools that there were 46 items and the total cost of these 46 items was a little over $4,700. So it was communicated in all of these schools for all of these schools that these are BCPS property and when the conclusion of remote operations or instructions um, was over that these items were to be returned to BCPS property. And next slide please. Actually, it's over the next four slides and we'll, we'll go through them a little, um, give a little bit out of time to look at them. But the next four slides are actually the results of all four of the objectives for the 44 schools that were in our review. So you can see which schools and which objectives where there were exceptions noted or no exceptions. And you can scroll through the next two, three slides, I believe it is. I believe that's the last one. And then you can go to the next slide. Um, before I take any questions, if you have any, I just wanted to say that an email was sent to each school that we reviewed with an attached report of their results. So it was communicated back to the uh, particular cardholders and um, approving officials and also personnel in business services were copied on that email so that they could see the, um, the outcome and results of all the schools reviewed. We are also in the process right now of completing a summary report of this, which will include the same information, and that should be issued shortly. Um, some of our next steps also is that we're going to be working with accounting to determine their monthly review process because there is a new PCARD system um, that was just implemented, and we're going to um, talk about building some analysis into our data analytics to review these transactions on a more routine basis. That's the end of my presentation. If anyone has any questions. Board members, any questions for Ms. Manna? Mr. Um, McMillian, I have some. Go ahead, Ms. Rowe, please. What are schools using P cards for? The rule is for small dollar purchases. Currently, the limit is it was 1000. However, it just recently changed to under $2000. Small purchases that cannot be used uh, for other methods like uh, through a purchase order or school activity funds. So what types of things would fall into that category? Office supplies, um, school supplies, there's um, postage. It's mainly teacher or office teacher requests for items that they need in their classrooms or school supplies or I'm sorry office supplies that are needed. OK, and. Um, so when the schools are using the P cards is that are they spending money that's from the school budget? It's the school's operating budget. Yes. From that specific school. Correct. Okay. From the, their, their procurement card is only linked is linked to their school's operating budget where they have 
um, the allowabilities to spend. Okay, so this is how the principal spends the schoolhouse budget is with these P cards. It's one of the ways they can spend the, the school's operating budget. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pastor has a question. Thank you. Um, just so I can play catch up um, since I retired, how are the, um, or who are the holders of the procurement cards? Um, Leah, let me just start with that question. Who are the holders of the procurement cards now? In the schools, it's typically who um, whoever the bookkeeper is, which in elementary schools, it's the administrative secretary in middle schools as well, the administrative secretary, or if they have a designated fiscal assistant. Um, the high schools, it's the fiscal assistant as well, and sometimes their administrative secretary also. In the high schools, they typically have um, some more card holders, which is usually like the department heads. Um, and in some cases, the principals are also a card holder. Okay, so particularly in secondary, um, where I'm familiar, do, what's the process now for that internal check on making sure, for making sure that the cards are being used appropriately um, and do the recipients or the users of those cards sign them out from any one of those people that you named and I'm talking maybe a department chair or do they hold those cards? They or are instructed and um, trained to hold the cards personally. They are not allowed to share them. No, I didn't mean share okay, them. I'm sorry. I, I mean, um, no, it's how I said it. So um, yeah, absolutely no sharing. But um, do so they hold on to them. OK, that's good enough. I, I just wanted to see if they, in essence, return them, let's say, to the bookkeeper yeah. after they used them and, and signed them in and had to sign them out when they got ready. So that's enough. Right? No, they are supposed to hold on to their own card. And there is a process with the new system. Um, the approving official in the schoolhouse, it would be the the principal. They must um, review and sign or sign off as approved on the monthly um, online, and the uh, and central office can see that as well if they're being reviewed and approved in a timely manner. Good, that and that's what I wanted to know, just to make sure that there should be no surprises that Correct. they are being examined. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Ms. Jones, do you have a question? Yeah, some of my questions were asked, but real quick, it seems like this is just an expense card to get um, buy supplies and things that you don't have to constantly ask these, you know, um, central office for. So I think one of my questions was asked by Ms. Uh, Pasture. So uh, I'm good. Thank you. Ms. Mana, I have one question. Sure. On the slide where it showed off to the right, it was about school res or I don't know whether school, but I noticed student residences. What what can you elaborate on that for us, please? Yeah, I can um, pull up to see what the items were. There were some, and I believe it was mainly at the special schools. There were some. Um, uh, assistant learning items that needed to be used by the students themselves. I can pull up some examples if you wanted to know what they were. I'm not sure what page is that. Can can you pull up that slide? Um, sure, Mr. Corns. I believe it's probably slide seven. Is that the one you're referring to? Yeah, but there was a column. Yeah, yeah, but there was a column. Okay, that I... then it would be eight, eight, nine, and ten. I believe there was um. Right after yeah, that. So the so the items fifty dollars plus at employee or student residency. So yes. Elaborate on that, please. They were items that um, the P card was used and delivered to either the student's home or the employee's home for use for um, operations of instruction. 
like the there I know there were several big whiteboards that were over $50 that the teachers may have needed to use. And if it were items at a student's residence, um, I'd have to open up and see what some of the items were. It's OK, but th that makes sense now that it, I understand it. It was items that the student was using for learning, but they were mainly special education purposes and needs. OK, thank you very much. You're Any welcome. additional questions? May I have a motion to accept the summary of procurement card review? So moved, Ro. Second, okay. past you. Thank you. Ms. Jamison, please have a, a roll call vote. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Pro? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Four in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is unfinished business. Our first item is the OLA audit update, and for that I call on Ms. Barr. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. As we decided at our last audit committee meeting, this topic will remain on the agenda as unfinished business until our monitoring activities are complete and any updates will be provided by our office and in some instances like this afternoon, the updates will be very brief. When we have detailed information to present, we're going to request that management be provided with the opportunity to discuss our results at the audit committee meetings. So this afternoon's report is brief. Just wanted to let the committee members know that we have compiled all of the audit uh, um, OLA audit findings from 2008, 2015, and 2020, their recommendations, BCPS management's response to the recommendations. And then we also identified any repeat findings throughout the three audits and the individuals who we think would be our primary contact to assist us uh, throughout the monitoring monitoring process with our inquiries, any documentation requests, and to provide us with status updates. We gave this information to management for their consideration, and once we get the information back from them, and we know that we've identified the proper contact contacts, we will proceed with the development of, a, of an approach um, to the monitoring of the OLA audit results. And that concludes my report related to that this evening. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Hearing no questions, may I have a motion to accept the OLA audit update? So moved, Ro. Second, passed you all. Ms. Jamison, a vote, please. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Four in favor, thank you. Thank you. Our next item is new business. Our first item is the FY22 operating budget analysis, and for that I call on Ms. Manna. Uh, actually, Mr. McMillian, I'm gonna start off on the, on the first slide. Mr. Corns, if you could go to the first slide. This is Andrea Barr, and just give a project interview uh, pro I'm sorry, project overview um, and, and why we're doing this. So basically this topic is a result of the prior audit committee's request to develop a document to provide to the board, which is based on the format of a document or information that is received from the county government. However, it's received by the board after our board submits its budget request to the county executive. And earlier this afternoon, I emailed um, a, a document to the committee members that is a draft internal document and it includes greater detail related to the information that's going to be highlighted during this presentation this afternoon. Uh, we didn't finalize the document for a variety of reasons um, because some information may not have been available or readily available in its entirety. We have some outstanding comparisons that we want to complete such as position comparisons, vacancy analysis, and some historical LEA comparisons. But the main reason that we didn't finalize it is because we want to make sure that the information that we compile is relevant and will meet the needs of the board. And consequently, I would ask the committee members this afternoon as we highlight some of the analysis and comparisons made 
to answer these questions as the information is presented. So we want to know if the information is already provided by the budget office, and if so, can the redundant information be eliminated? What information is missing that you would like to have included or see in the report? Mm -hmm. What additional LEA comparisons, local education, um, other school system comparisons would you like to see? Does this project provide any benefit to the board? And if so, should we continue this project for this year or should we just use this as a basis and foundation to provide information for subsequent budget requests? And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Mano. Thank you, um, Ms. Corn Mr. Corn. you can go over to um, the third slide. Um, and the information on the next few slides were pulled together using previous year's adopted budget information and um, the FY22 proposed budget information. The information is f probably familiar with you, but it may be shown in different views to show some historical perspectives. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. This is a bar graph of the history of funds received from fiscal year 15 to fiscal year 22's proposed budget. It shows that funds have slightly increased overall each year. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And this graph represents a three year comparison of BCPS's budget within the typical MSDE required categories. Um, the 2020 numbers are or levels are from the actual expenditures. 21 is the adjusted or adopted budget and 22 is the proposed budget. OK, next slide. So for the next few slides, the uh, summaries are BCPS's FY22's budget proposal. Um, go ahead and you can go to the next slide, please. This pie chart is uh, fiscal year 22's proposed budget broken down into the MSDE categories. BCPS is requesting 37.4 million more than the FY22 adopted budget. And next slide, please. This is a summary of the maintenance of effort. A full analysis of this calculation is within the report that was shared with the audit committee members. Um, but in summary, fiscal year 22's proposed share is 41.7 million more than the required MOU. Uh, we have noted on this slide also that we used updated enrollment numbers from MSDE. These numbers were provided after the budget proposal was prepared. So if you take it back to the budget books, you might see a little difference there. OK, and then next slide, um, I'm going to have Lauren Crew, who did work on this project and completed all of these comparisons for us. She'll present a summary of the increases and decreases in the proposed FY22 budget compared to the FY21 adopted budget. Thank you, Mana. Um, this slide and the next two slides are excerpts from Exhibit 3 on page 5 of the uh, document you were provided today. Uh, exhibit 3 shows the increases and decreases that support the overall change to the FY 2021 adopted budget. Uh, this slide shows the increases and decreases in both personnel and personnel re related expenditures. Uh, the relate to the changes in positions as well as the increase in increments and longevities for a total increase of 16.3 million related to personnel and personnel related expenses. But you can look at more detail of where the money has come in and come out for the personnel expenses. Next slide, please. This goes into the same detail, but related to operating expenses. Um, they'll show you can see an overall decrease in operating expenses of approximately 1.4 million to offset the increases. Next slide, please. And this last slide related to the changes is related to uh, non um, like the not other costs. As you can see, the largest change is related to federal and restricted grant programs but it just kind of shows you where the changes are and then the total change for the entire budget. Next slide, please. 
The two slides following this will be related to how the positions change and some analysis related to those positions. Uh, next slide, please. This chart, which is also Exhibit 5 on page 6 of the document provided, it shows the changes in general fund positions. None of the special funded positions are included in this comparison. Um, for these positions, we separated them by both school-based and non-school-based, and then from that, we compared it to the number of students, so you can compare how many positions we have each year based on 1,000 students, and you can see how the numbers change if they increase and decrease. We are currently working on the possibility of doing this kind of comparison to other LEAs to see how BCPS compares for both school-based and non-school-based versus the 1,000 students. Next slide, please. This slide goes on to show where the positions are being decreased this year, or in some cases increased, but overall decreased and the cost savings of the overall decrease of positions for the FY 2022 general fund positions. Next slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Mana, who will review the slides related to the LEA comparisons. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we looked at other local school um, education agencies that we often refer to or consult with when we do various comparisons. Um, if you can go ahead to the next slide, please, Mr. Coins. This is listing the seven other school jurisdictions that we included in our budget comparisons. Um, and we noted here Baltimore City, we did not include the 22 into our 22 comparisons because they don't uh, present them on their, they don't uh, um, post them until after it is approved through the approval process, which won't be until April or May. We can go ahead to the next slide, please. For This is a listing of the different categories that the MSDE uses um, to evaluate the, the different comparisons that we did in all of the other jurisdictions. So next slide, please. This slide and the next slide shows Baltimore County's number um, appropriation amounts and then also this the six relevant to FY22. Montgomery and Prince George's are the two larger LEAs compared to Baltimore County Schools and then Anne Arundel, Howard, Frederick and Harford are smaller than Baltimore County. So in in the sense of all of these were the, the third largest um, school system in Maryland. You can see the appropriation levels for this page and you can go ahead to the next page. Are all those categorized in the 13 levels or 13 categories? I'm sorry, but the next two pages is where I wanted to highlight more. Um, next slide, I believe it's slide 20. These are the same LEAs charted out, but this is by the appropriation request per student, and this is based on the September 30th, 2021 projected enrollment numbers. So as you can see, BCPS's our placement is in line with other LEA comparisons on some um, some of the categories, and sometimes BCPS's placement is higher or lower than the other LEAs in in some of the categories. And there's also more detailed um, charts of this analysis on page 10 and 11, along with other uh, various years analysis on, on other pages within the report that was sent to the audit committee members. And you can go ahead to the next slide, please, Mr. Forms. This shows the other categories with the uh, appropriation request per student amount. And then this, the last slide is a chart showing BCPS's FY20's actual 21's adopted and 22's proposed budgets per student appropriation compared to the average of all of the LEAs that we reviewed. And in each of these years, we're slightly below the average. Uh, and as I said, there, there are other exhibits in the report that we included, and we're also currently working on more comparisons that Andrea Barr spoke about. So if we can go to the next slide and circle back to um, any feedback you may have into the questions that Andrea Barr 
uh, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Yes, about, so, I'm uh -huh. sorry. So I'll repeat the questions. Um, is the information already provided by the budget office? And if so, can the redundant information be eliminated? What information is missing that you would like to have included? Uh, what additional LEA comparisons would you like to see? Does this project even provide any benefit to the board? And if it does, should it continue, the analysis continue for this year or be used as a basis to provide information for subsequent years? Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? I have Mr. questions. Williams. Ms. Pastor. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, there were way too many questions for me to remember, and I couldn't write them that quickly, but the one that sticks in my head, is this a useful information? Exceedingly so. And I will absolutely, without equivocation, want to see um, this, this kind of particularly the comparison to continue because there's so many things that uh, we should be looking at as a system um, as as we process salaries um, considering we are the third uh, largest however I'm looking at systems that are smaller than ours uh, that in terms of salaries do look better we need to be cognizant of those kinds of things. So everything that you have included here help us to stay focused, will help us uh, to stay on the right track, will help us to be competitive um, because we often get questions about uh, why we don't, what, what our, our staffing looks like, bodies in, bodies out. Um, minority staffing in, minority staffing out, or not at all. And I think the information that you have just presented here um, shows us um, why some of these things are happening, why we are looking at bodies out and nobody bodies coming in and taking a look at where some of these people might be going in our surrounding counties. This was in incredibly um, important. And at some point, Mr. McMillian, um, I'm a, I would like to make a motion. I don't know what that point is, so you tell me, but this is critical information. Thank you so much. Ms. Pastor, how about if we take the other questions and then come back to your motion? Sounds like a good plan. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Joes, your question. Thank you. Actually, it's not so much a question, Ms. Barr, if you could go back to the third from last uh, slide. This is uh, essentially good information because we constantly bombarded with the narrative that Baltimore County, um, one side does not pay as well and the other side we pay too much. And it looks like from looking at these numbers, it's right there in the median. And in order for us to keep qualified staff, whether they're instructional, administrative and good staff, we have to pay them competitive salaries because there are a lot of other school districts. Uh, so this is really good information. I really would like this to come to the full board because uh, this at least provides evidence based data to the narrative that, uh, you know, uh, that we keep hearing all the time. So uh, thank you. And this is the, the chart that I was looking at. Um, so I, I'll look at it some more, but yes, I, I would like this to come to the full board. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, any questions? Yes, I just wanted to um, thank Ms. Barr and her staff for putting this together. Um, she and I had extensive conversations about what this should look like. Um, and I think that for the first time asking the Office of Internal Audit to do this, this looks really fantastic. Um, there may be other things that need to be added. Nothing comes to mind at the present moment, but this type of comparison with comparisons between other LEAs is extremely helpful. This is not duplicative information um, for what we're provided in the budget. And the fact that the Office of Internal Audit is independent from the um, offices asking for the money in the budget, I think makes 
the information that they're providing us extremely useful and I would like to see this continue on an annual basis. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Barr, I have one comment. When you mentioned whether the information was redundant because it was someplace else, like the budget office per, you know, produces it or, or, or displays it someplace else, I like the idea that the information is all in one place. And so rather than flip flop back and forth, you know, we could go to this document and find the information that we're looking for. So I, I think that you keep it the way it is, but that's just my opinion. Uh, Ms. Pastor, your motion, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I um, move that the internal audit department report to the full board quarterly offering information relative to their plan as well as information that is um, germane to the direction of the board. Uh, I can repeat it or put it in the chat as um, desired, but again, the, the bottom line is that I would like the internal audit to report to the full board four times quarterly. Do we have a second? A second row. Okay, May Ms. Ms. Jamison, can we, all right, let's have a discussion, any more discussion on the topic? Yeah, I, I want to, I, I want to um, uh, say a few words about that, if I may, Mr. McMillian. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I won't speak for anyone other than myself, but I, when I came to the board, I was very clear about um, my responsibilities in terms of the superintendent. However, I was not clear about my uh, the relationship of the board to the audit department. So since then, I have looked at the organization chart. And if we look at the organization chart for Baltimore County Public Schools, we see the board and coming out of one side, if you're looking at it, coming out of the right side is the superintendent and on the other side is uh, this department. And that there is no tie between those two sides indicates that this department is autonomous in that regard, but also um, connected with the school board. I find that in order to really evaluate any personnel from this department or to process uh, how we can share projects, um, we need to know. We need to know what this department does. I see your department as sitting right in the center because you are able to look at everything. It's, it's like the New Yorkers view the picture, the New Yorkers view of the world and how the world is small and New York is large. I see your department being that critical to how successful this whole school system can be. Every board member needs to understand all that you are able to do and have done and will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Any other comments from the board members? Questions or comments, board members? Okay, Miss. Let's vote on the motion. Ms. Jamison, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Four in favor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the FY22 operating budget analysis? So no, moved row. past your second row. Okay, Ms. Jamison, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jones? Ms. Jones? Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. 
We're in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any additional or any further business? Mr. McMillian, I, I'm, this is Andrea Barr. I'm seeking um, clarification from Ms. Rowe back to the subject um, related to investigations. May I ask my clarifying question, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe, just, just so that I make sure that we're following up on um, your request related to the non-fraud, waste, and abuse, uh, I wanted to just assure you that if an allegation comes in about a particular supervisor or manager, we would not forward that to that supervisor or manager. Just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. And however, as part of the investigatory process, that particular supervisor or manager eventually would need to be interviewed. So I just wanted to clarify that. But I also wanted to know, were you just concerned about complaints related to the Department of Human Resources or all complaints related to um, a supervisor employee uh, matter? Um, I'm concerned about all complaints related to supervisor employee matters and things related to those types of relationships. I just want to also make sure that the committee is aware that there are certain types of complaints that our office would not handle, um, for example, if it if it's um, a teacher to teacher matter or uh, student to teacher matter, things of that nature. Some investigations related to personnel are investigated by the Department of Human Resources. So I just wanted to, to make sure because we have new committee members that that they are aware that we would not necessarily in our office handle all complaints related to that. And thank okay. you for allowing me to ask me ask my clarifying question. Thank you. Absolutely. Is there any further business? Yes, Mr. McMillian, I have a question. Please. Um, so at our last meeting, we the, the committee did vote about the charters, and I wanted to know if you had had the opportunity to speak to the board chair and the superintendent about when those charters might be put on the agenda for the full board so that the full board can consider the passage of those charters. So that's that question is to me? Yes. No, I haven't. I haven't talked to anybody about the charters other than Ms. Barr, but I can certainly do that. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. You're welcome. Any additional business? May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, bro. I'm not, I'm not sure. Did I hear a second? No, second past your. Ms. Jameson, may we have a roll call vote? Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Four in favor, thank you. Since there is no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for, for making this first meeting for me. Uh, it, it was pretty pretty much a breeze. Thank you very much for your help. Goodbye. Thank you Bye. all. Good evening. Mr. McMillian. Good night. Thank you.